Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Uh, welcome back to Vandenberg Space Force Base here in California. Uh, it is, if you can't hear it <laughs> in my microphone, it is very windy out here, very windy. Uh, but this is the second launch attempt, the second day and second launch attempt of Firefly's Alpha rocket. And this is, uh, this is an awesome rocket. We've been out here spending a lot of time with this vehicle. And I am very happy to report that the rocket is looking fantastic. The rocket is 100% ready to go. Uh, the teams are currently uh, reevaluating the weather conditions and waiting for an update on that. Uh, and hopefully we will be getting that here soon. But I just wanted to go on air and give you guys a little update that everything's actually really good on the rocket's end. They fixed the, there was a helium pressure issue last night. They found a fix for it and they're ready to go again today. But now, uh, you know, weather is at, you can actually tell in that image there that it's, it's quite overcast and actually it is it is rather windy it might not look like it but yeah it's it's that's what's giving us the problems today but let's go ahead and we'll go through our normal show here and just see if we can't get you guys at least keep you guys entertained while we wait to see what the latest is so uh, I'll, I think the first thing we need to do, of course, is go to a little website to learn more about this mission and why it's exciting and why it's cool and a big first. So we'll go on over to everydayastronaut.com and we'll click on the upcoming launches to see our pre-launch previews. And this pre-launch preview is FLTA-002, which is known as To the Black. So this is going to be taking off. Oops, I didn't refresh it because today is no longer September 11th. Man, that's like one of my only jobs is to refresh my own website and... I fail sometimes. But we have the same exact launch window that we did yesterday, which is 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time uh, till 7. So that's uh, that's going to be 22 UTC through 02 UTC on the 13th. So, or just 2 o'clock, I mean, sorry, UTC. So, um, yeah, here we go. This is, uh, this is taking off hopefully today, September 12th. Uh, the mission name, again, is FLTA-002, which is to the black. The launch provider for this, this is Firefly Aerospace. And I just about <laughs> lost my monitor. That darn wind. It is, it's crazy, honestly. Um, let's see. So the, the rocket for this, this is Firefly's Alpha rocket. 
the launch location for this. We are out here at Slick 2 Vandenberg Space Force Base here in California in the United States. And of course, SLC, uh, you've probably heard this from me a thousand times, but SLC is Space Launch Complex. And uh, if it was just LC, that'd be Launch Complex. Uh, that would be indicative of something like at Kennedy Space Center. They call it only LC, Launch Complex. But on Space Force bases, previously Air Force bases, they tend to go with SLC, Space Launch Complex. Uh, the payload mass for this is about 35 kilograms is all for a rocket that can take uh, over, uh, well more than 10 times that. The rocket can take over 1,000 kilograms to orbit. It's just taking up a small demonstration payload since today is a test flight. Today is um, you know, a demonstration mission to prove out the capabilities of this vehicle. So they're taking it nice and easy on the rocket. Uh, and one of the reasons they're taking it nice and easy is for this, because it's, it's going to a 300 kilometer orbit, uh, low Earth orbit, but at a 137 degree inclination. For those of you that know anything about rocket science, this rocket's actually flying in a way backwards. It's flying against the rotation of the Earth. It's flying retrograde uh, compared to the Earth's rotation. So if you're flying eastwardly, you'd be flying at like a zero degree inclination on the equator, you'd be going directly around the equator. 90 degree inclination would be around the poles. And uh, in this case, this thing's gonna be going actually uh, retrograde. So beyond 90 degrees, almost entirely backwards. So it's flying west out of California. The main reason they're doing that, honestly, is just because, uh, you know, for a demonstration mission, for a, a total prototype here, you know, first time flying this rocket, they want to just send it out over the ocean, make sure it's not overflying any land and just keeping the corridor nice and safe, just nice and conservative, kind of like the payload again, nice and conservative, 35 kilograms, nice and easy. So yeah. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Nope, that's not a capability of Alpha. Uh, it might be a capability for some future launch vehicles, though. Um, and the, they do not recover the fairings on these vehicles either. You know, again, small sat launch vehicle. Uh, it, no one else is really doing that out there yet. So, yep, uh, this is this is the second launch of the Alpha. Their first launch attempt was about a year ago. This is the second launch for Firefly. This is the first launch of Firefly in 2022. The 10th launch from Vandenberg in 2022. The 116th orbital launch attempt of this year. So it is a very, very busy year in spaceflight. So, uh, yeah, that's that's excellent. We've got a, uh, a little bit here about what some of the payloads are. Um, so there's a handful of small and CubeSats on here, uh, CubeSats and small sats. And the first one that we're going to talk about is Teachers in Space. And they actually provided us with a fantastic video that uh, will help you know more about this exciting payload. On this upcoming mission, we have three payloads flying with us. All of them are very experimental and heavily into uh, research and development, and specifically about uh, raising awareness in space. Teachers in Space, we provide actual space opportunities for teachers to actually be embedded in preparing a rocket for launch, preparing a satellite, integrating the satellite. Firefly have given us a brilliant opportunity to launch our own first educational orbital satellite. The idea behind Serenity was to build a carrier that we could use for student experiments. Now we're doing the ultimate test on orbit. And if it turns out to work, now we have a tool that we can put in our tool belt to help astronauts with radiation. We're putting a blockchain experiment into space. What we're looking for is to test how we can communicate efficiently from the Earth to blockchain satellite perform various types of transactions. This is the beginning of several types of experiments we want to do to test the limits of blockchains in space. I'm looking forward to the Serenity 4, 5, and 6. I want to see what those are going to look like and what experiments the students are going to bring. We want to give them the opportunity to put that on orbit and do something amazing. We are up and running between the teaching, the launching, and the receiving and analyzing and presenting of the data, and it's like we have our own space program for teachers. So yeah, that's a, that's a pretty awesome little payload here, but the other one that's on board here today, uh, another one that we have a, a video for that we'll show here in a second, is the Tech Ed Set 15. 
And this is coming from NASA's Ames Research Center in California. And they actually made a really cool video about it because this is actually a really cool demonstration mission uh, about helping to de... And you can tell here in their mission patch as well. Uh, this is a program to work on deorbiting satellites, uh, small sats, which, you know, obviously the more and more we launch uh, CubeSats and small sats, you know, there's a lot of work to make sure that we don't create uh, more orbital debris and more orbital just, you know, orbital junk. So this is a demonstration mission to make sure we know how to deorbit debris. So, uh, yeah, let's roll that one. NASA's mission is to help stimulate an advanced commercial space. We collaborate with our young professionals within NASA, private industry, universities, and basically use this as a cauldron to advance a lot of technologies through experiments. In this case, it's uh, helping to supply a, a very quick turnaround nanosatellite to the, the Firefly team. The Tech Education Satellite Series uh, is a rapid prototype series of incremental CubeSat developments. It's a good pathfinder for new launch vehicles to help reduce the risk that we have for other NASA missions. There's so much you can do with small cube satellites. I mean, we can help with climate change. We can help with climates in Mars, climates in Venus. We're doing pathfinding efforts to enable you know, manufacturing and low Earth orbit. We're really interested in taking the nanosatellite concept and moving that to the lunar environment as well as Mars. Our primary payload actually for TechSat 15 is our exoatmospheric braking device, which we like to call our exobrake. Our exobrake is made out of a material that's the same exact thermal blanketed material that was on the space shuttle, which enables us to have a certain amount of control authority in, in regions of our atmosphere where most other CubeSats cannot. We're also flying solar panels that are commercial off-the-shelf units that lowers the cost of, of the most critical component of our satellite. I could actually command the satellite using email, actually. When we were uh, quarantined at home, was, I was actually commanding the satellites in my bedroom. I got my aerospace engineering degree from San Jose State. You're taught very practical things from the get-go that translated almost seamlessly into industry work, especially at NASA, and, and integrating here with Firefly. Actually, she was in a very strategic location, being next to NASA Ames Research Center um, and being near Silicon Valley, we have an opportunity to work with technology that's actually cutting edge and then be able to apply that in, in a space environment. My generation is involved in watching all the Apollo launches when I was a child and I always wanted to work at NASA and teach and be part of this. We have the job of turning science fiction into science fact. It's an opportunity for me to also work with our younger staff and excite them. They're going to define the next generation of space and space exploration. So yeah, that's obviously a, a pretty cool payload there. But there's also uh, there's all there's three more uh, really cool little uh, CubeSats on this rocket as well, uh, including the the AMSAT EA Genesis and also the FOSA systems, FOSASAT 1B, and, uh, oh, and I think I missed one here, the Libre Space Foundation Pico Bus. So yeah, if you wanna read more about these particular payloads, there's actually a lot of really good information here about them. But there's also artwork on board this vehicle. Again, because this is a demonstration mission, you know, they're, they're flying at this point relatively, you know, low risk, low cost payloads just to be able to prove everything out and basically give a, a nice, cheaper free ride to people uh, that can get the opportunity to, to send a, a payload into orbit. So yeah, this go through our the rest of our pre-launch preview. And of course, thank you to Florian Flo for writing it and the rest of the website crew for keeping everything up to date on our awesome website, everydayastronaut.com. But actually, I have another website that I want to tell you guys about, and this is this is again this is a me thing. This is uh, this is still my show. I'm so thankful to our friends at Firefly for trusting us to do any of this stuff. But I have to say, yesterday I was <laughs> scrambling because I forgot the the numbers on this rocket. I forgot the actual thrust numbers and the payload capacity, and I just ended up clicking out of just sheer. Oh, I'll just go to Firefly.com, and I have to say, their website here is actually amazing. Uh, and it does show all of the specs of this vehicle in great detail, including the payload capacity to low Earth orbit, the payload capacity to SSO, so um, sun synchronous orbit. You can even click here and see some of the inside, the, the payload dimensions and stuff. 
This is really, really, really slick. You get to see the, the thrust on the, the lightning engine up there. You get to see the thrust on the first stage and all the specific impulse and everything. I mean, this is a really cool website. I would definitely surf around here uh, and check out Firefly's, uh, their own website. I mean, obviously, I think our website's pretty cool, but I got to say, this is actually awesome. And one of the other things that's really fun, um, this might be my computer issue saying network error. <laughs> that's my bad. Um, but they also have the Blue Ghost Lunar Lander, which is really, really cool. Uh, so they have more details on that. So they are part of the NASA Eclipse program. And uh, and they're going to be launching um, the the uh, a Lunar Lander that's going to be scouting for the Artemis program. And it's really, really cool. So there's a lot of cool stuff on here. And obviously, uh, we've been talking to a lot of engineers and a lot of we've been dealing a lot with the IT and network people to help us make all of this stream possible. Uh, let me tell you, the one thing they do need, and this, again, is just coming purely from me, not from them, they need more hands. They, they're, they're hiring like crazy because they've got some huge things. You know, they're working on the first stage of the Antares rocket now. They're, they're the new contractor that's developing the first stage using bigger uh, engines even, still using the tap-off cycle. Uh, I've heard all the, all the network guys being like, yeah, we need more hands here. So if you are, you know, if you are looking for uh, work in the aerospace industry, Firefly is an awesome company. It's just been an absolute pleasure to be uh, hanging out with these people out here. Uh, Everyone's been very hardworking and, and problem solving, and it's it's very fun. It's very that that kind of energy is extremely infectious, and I and I love uh, working alongside them. So yeah, you should definitely check out their careers page because I think it's full of opportunities. Uh, sometimes some out here in California, but they're actually based out of Austin, Texas. So if you do live in the Austin area, or you want to live in the Austin area, I would definitely check out their careers page. So that's just a that was just from me. Uh, that. I'm not getting paid to say that, I promise. So um, let's see. We actually, unfortunately, right at the top of the hour here, we do have an update that today's launch opportunity is scrubbed. So yes, um, unfortunately, that is the official update. It was weather. The weather is not good. The range is not ready, and it is a scrubbed opportunity. Um, there is not another potential, uh, there is not a date on the range yet for their next opportunity because actually, believe it or not, Vandenberg out here is about to be swamped with some really, really big missions and, and a, a bunch of ha a handful of uh, big things going on too. So um, honestly, yeah, they, they're working with the range and with uh, the, the launch license providers uh, to figure out when their next opportunity is. Now, for my team, as, as obviously as frustrating it is that is for you at home watching this or friends and family uh, of, of anyone working, you know the, the frustration for the teams uh, and obviously even our minor inconvenience and frustration of having to tear everything down here and, and return to either Texas or Florida for Artemis. We have no idea at this point, uh, a team everyday astronaut here, uh, but the, the teams of Firefly, I'm sure... Uh, are upset, you know, that they aren't able to launch with today's weather. Uh, that's that's always a bummer. That's the one thing we can't control because I know they're excited that the vehicle is looking so stinking good. It was one of my favorite things about um, a company like this is how quickly they can they can address issues. So yesterday they saw a drop in helium pressure on the second stage, and they can literally take the rocket down from vertical to horizontal in like a few minutes. And just once the vehicle's safe, they can just go out there and, and work on it. They can just literally fix it on the fly. Um, I wish the more traditional, you know, I, I came from seeing the Artemis launch and the more traditional way of doing things with the space launch system and stuff and knowing just how hard it is to tweak on a vehicle like that and make changes or anything. And then the teams out here just go out and they're like, yep, yeah, we're good to go. And the rocket was totally happy. Everything was looking good. So I know the teams are upset that it, it is scrubbed because, yeah, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun for anybody. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, I think we'll probably hang out for just a couple more minutes here. I'll try to maybe answer a couple questions while we have airtime uh, since you guys were all waiting. I am going to throw up a little disclaimer on our, on our YouTube channel that says Scrubs so we don't get any people um, upset that we have – uh, that we would be misleading anyone. So, uh, and, and speaking of that, we definitely have a, a few generous donations that I should probably get to for sure. So, um, I, but before we even do that, I need to just again thank. This is this is a, a totally a me thing. Uh, there's just been so many people that have been working crazy hours, working extra hours, working throughout the night, working on stuff just like you wouldn't believe. I, I can't believe how hard 
uh, that my team here has been able to work. I mean, it's just impressive, and I'm so thankful for everyone here. But also the teams at Firefly that have been providing support on at the weirdest times. Uh, you know, it's just been absolutely amazing. So I feel like I, I need to I need to say my thank yous quick, and then I'm going to answer some of your questions here. We have a handful of, of things, and and then I'll probably just get out of here, so I'm not bugging you because I don't know what else I'm going to do besides the app for a bunch, but <laughs> which is too bad because it's. We do have an orbital rocket on the launch pad, but just weather was not cooperating. But I need to thank Andrew Taylor for you know doing everything here with the production team, uh, designing the van and and teaching me a lot about how to run a show. Uh, it's it's really uh, it, he's been just uh, huge help and, and makes this all possible. Uh, of course, we have Ryan Chalinski from Cosmic Perspective, who also is on team, not gonna sleep almost at all because he's been running like setting up. I don't even know how many cameras. Too many. Eight? Eight? Ca he's running and setting up and having to wire up the triggers and all the wiring for eight cameras on the pad. That's insane. Uh, I think one time for like Falcon Heavy, I think I was managing like five or six cameras by myself. And I was just exa absolutely exhausted at the end of just that one day. And Ryan's been doing this now basically since Artemis, really. <laughs> just on no sleep. And, and he helped me get out here in California in the van. So the whole team at Cosmic Perspective. Because also Mary Liz Bender has been staying up all night for the last like two nights helping to make this graphic interface uh, possible on the, the webcast. So uh, that's been absolutely amazing. And same with my girlfriend, Allie, who designed the, the interface. Uh, she also is the person that does all of our merchandise and makes Everyday Astronaut look cool. That's Allie from Gravity Coast. Um, big shout out to her as well and for helping. She also helps run the show now too. So she's all she's all trained up on all that. So we also had Matt Welch out here operating cameras and just helping, just doing so many random like, hey, go grab that, you know. So huge shout out to him. Ben Steinman has helped with all of the networking like crazy just – trying to problem solve and doing so many things. We always appreciate Ben Steinman's help. But, Col but, but Colton Covington with Tomorrow, TMRO, one of my favorite YouTube shows ever. They're honestly who got me started on spaceflight news and spaceflight coverage is Tomorrow, TMRO and the teams over there. Colton uh, stayed up the last two nights again working on this overlay and doing tons of problem solving literally right up uh, till, till this morning and today. So so much, so thankful for, for Colton and Mary Liz Bender for making that all possible. But um, yeah, we also have to thank the Space Launch Delta 30 for their support. We have literally people helping us out here at the pad all, all time. It's just been incredible. Uh, and their ability to support Firefly on this mission, all the things that they do behind the scenes, including even providing tracking assets and range and all that stuff. It's it's nuts. So yeah. Um, we also have, uh, we wanted to, we needed to thank also the new CEO, Bill Weber, for again entrusting us here at Everyday Astronaut to be able to do this stream and the people that I've been working with, like like Jeff uh, and, and Kim, for, you know, again, providing lines of communication that have made this all possible. So, yeah, man, it's it's been, uh, I wish that we could have seen this thing fly today. We have everything ready to go. Everything's finally good on our end and on the rocket's end, and it's just, uh then, of course, weather. We'll, there was a hurricane. There literally was a hurricane coming through California for the first time since, like, 1999. So some things you just can't control, my friends. Some things you just can't control. But I'll answer a few of your guys' questions here, and, uh, and we'll hang out for just a, a little bit of time while we've got the stream running, while we've got some of you guys hanging out, um, providing you guys an opportunity. So... Um, yeah, I, I did want to mention, actually, again, since this is still my show, which I love, I love that Firefly trusts me to just kind of chat and, and and half represent them on, you know, on an important day, like a launch day. But I do need to give, I, I've been so, seeing so much of this. Um, this is a, this is a question that we've been seeing a lot, is uh, from Ramosel asking about today's, this morning's Blue Origin flight. Yeah, there was a full-blown launch abort triggered on today's Blue Origin New Shepard flight. And it was uncrewed. It happened to be an uncrewed flight. They occasionally will just pack the the, the New Shepard capsule full of uh, just science payloads on a suborbital, you know, sounding rocket ride, basically. So you can get four minutes of, of zero G of microgravity. Uh, there's still important science that can be done. Uh, realistically, you know, out at NASA, I think it's, a, uh, I forget which, which Plum Brook maybe or somewhere uh, in Ohio, maybe it's, uh, Glenn Research Center. I don't remember. They have this vacuum tunnel that's like uh, several, like maybe 100 or 200 meters deep, and they try to you know get microgravity experience, but they get like 
two seconds of microgravity, and that's the, having this huge vacuum chamber that that goes deep into the ground. So to be able to get four minutes of of, uh, of clean zero g is still very valuable for science experiments. And uh, yeah, this, anyway, they're flying on crewed flight, laden with lots of experiments, and um, and they actually had a failure of the booster right around max q, right as the engine was throttling down. The the engine. Uh, seemed to let go, and that triggered the, the launch abort system, which is a solid rocket booster inside the capsule that jettisoned the capsule, and that pulled it clean away from the, the booster, and then it, uh, it it ended up you know going up, getting high enough altitude, of course, to deploy its drogue chutes and then its parachutes, and then it, it touched down softly. Notice I said it touched down softly. So many people, I don't know how this is still not drilled in people's heads. They forget that that vehicle has a retro rocket system, that fires right at touchdown. So you always see this big cloud of dirt and dust that gets kicked up as the capsule touches down. That's totally normal. It had three good main shoots. That looked like an absolutely normal, nominal, nominal uh, touchdown, 100%. Um, so it looked like, you know, luckily it was uncrewed, but it really seems like they, they went through the paces today and they, they truly tested out, um, they truly tested out the, uh, the launch abort system. So yeah. Oh, interesting. So um, uh, I'm getting an update here. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up their their Twitter quick because I do want to I'm gonna read that myself. <laughs> no, I uh, listen, Andrew. I trust your Twitter reading skills. I'm just curious. I want to I want to see this because uh, I think people will be interested in, in seeing it on air. Firefly Aerospace. Uh, give me one second here. They seem to have updated us with this that uh, the Firefly teams. Uh, are working with the Delta th with the, th the 30th here to make a decision on today's launch attempt, and they're going for the 19th and 20th. That's in a, a little over a week. <laughs> Let's hope the SLS just totally scrubs, because we're in the ultimate conundrum at this point. Holy cow! Uh, wow. Uh, all right. Yep, I, I, I don't know what to do with this information at this point. You are seeing my live reaction of, oh, dear God, <laughs> how do I manage driving across the country and or back and forth or who on earth knows what? Uh, but that's actually awesome. I'm, I'm really excited because we do have everything all wired in here. So maybe we can actually kind of keep stuff half set up and and that'd be actually really easy for us here. So, yeah, sorry, I don't need to be re mean to be reacting to uh, to that, but that is good news that we actually have a launch date already in the calendar uh, for just uh, seven and eight days away from now. So a week from today and and, to and tomorrow. So, yeah, um, I guess we'll we'll figure out how to do that and and what that looks like, and we'll make do. We'll make it work. Ryan and I are like reassuring ourselves, going, yeah. <laughs> We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So yeah, uh, that's that's actually great news though because I've been absolutely just so ready for this to happen. So um, let's answer a few more of your guys' questions while we got time. Um, let's see. I don't, I don't know what this is, but thank you very much, PSR. I appreciate that. Uh, also appreciate John Bowers' tip. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Um, Let's see. I'm trying to read. I want to read some interesting questions because we do have you guys on 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 air. So the the well, I don't know what that was. If we had a funny rocket go, <laughs> and then pair character flying in the air. Those aren't questions. So I don't think we can we can do that. <laughs> I don't know what those. I mean, obviously, one's a little uh, emoji thing. Musical wolves always asks good questions. Um, is it is it better to fly normal than retrograde on test flight? Also, what are the advantages of retro retrograde orbit? Thank you for re-asking a question, Musical Wolves. Always great to have you on the show asking wonderful questions. Uh, musical, I'm I'm really impressed actually that Musical Wolves is is a very avid space flight fan and, and watches. I, I see Musical Wolves at, at and NSFs and Lab Padres and and our streams all the time. Always able to come up with really good questions. So I, I feel like shout out to Musical Wolves for always asking awesome questions. So um, yeah, the answer is for launching out of Vandenberg, which is on the west coast of the United States. Um, if you fly, it is actually harder to fly retrograde. It's harder to fly against the rotation of the Earth. But when you're only carrying 35 kilograms and when you're only trying to demonstrate getting to orbit 
period, it really doesn't matter. Performance is out the window. Who really cares? Firefly is just trying to get to orbit and doing everything they can to, to make sure that they're flying the safest corridor. So that's really the whole reason that they're flying retrograde is to fly away from California. Get it, get the rocket out over the ocean as quickly as possible and, and as safely as possible. Uh, it's just the safe and right thing to do. You know, Firefly and the, the teams here at the range and Space Force are, you know, have done everything in their power to make sure to keep people and property safe. So that's first and foremost foremost when you have a demonstration mission like this when you have a brand new rocket that is uh, still going through its, its proving grounds yeah that's exactly why they're flying retrograde to get to orbit though it is not an advantage it is definitely harder to do so yeah um that's a great question but you know flying if you're flying in florida you fly east so you get to inherently you will notice that almost every launch complex around the world is up against the east coast uh, up against water going east so they can take advantage of the Earth's rotation. Of course, that's not the same for Kazakhstan because there is no ocean in Kazakhstan where they launch uh, for Roscosmos. So Roscosmos and, and Russia will always overfly land, but very sparsely populated areas. And then same with China has a few launch complexes that are inland, but they do have a couple new ones that are on the coast for those reasons. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let's keep going for a little bit. Um, this is a good question on from Claudio. What is my take on the current status of Artemis launch and its delays? So, I mean, honestly, I, I'm I'm not nearly as disappointed in the delays and the scrubs that Artemis has experienced as, as some people are. Um, it's to It really is normal with a new system to have uh, some teething issues. And I know that, you know, SLS is not really a new system, but it still is. The Literally... I know it has a lot of commonality with the space shuttle, but the things that are that they're having issues with is a lot of the things, the ground support systems, the things that are new, like literally connecting new umbilicals to the vehicle because it has, you know, larger pipes, larger tanks, larger everything. It's all new. It's not like it's this totally just re-pieced together space shuttle. It just really isn't. So, um, yeah, they, uh, they, I, 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 in my opinion. Uh, I, I just think this is pretty normal. We've seen, you know, teething pains. Anyone that's watched SpaceX's Starship, which is a developmental rocket as well, uh, you know, you've, you've, you're familiar with scrubs. You're familiar with, you know, they tank it up. They realize there's a problem. They, and they have to go back and fix it. That's that's pretty normal, you know. Um, even here with Firefly's Alpha, uh, you know, yesterday they had saw an issue on the rocket that they didn't like, and that's the beauty of New Space. And with a, a nimble company, they can just go out there fix it and go for the next day's launch attempt already um so yeah i'm 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 i have some grace for things like when the sls scrubs even though it's taken so long and i know people are upset with the the length of time and the the budget and all that stuff but it really is just how aerospace works and a friendly reminder most of the problems are because the rocket uses hydrogen hydrogen is very hard to work with there's a reason that very few companies utilize hydrogen so yeah so um, this is from uh, Vogue Launch wants to <laughs> wants to ask: Is the pointy end up and the flamey end down? That is something we can confirm. We can confirm if honestly, if we stayed on air long enough, we'd likely see the teams take the rocket horizontal, which is just a, a shame here that we uh, don't have that that or that we probably won't be live when that happens because it goes down. They can take this rocket vertical and horizontally very quickly, very very quickly. It, it's just so nimble and quick. Um, you know, I was out here when this launch pad was was for Delta II, when Slick 2 was actually used for Delta, the Delta II rocket. And let me tell you, they used to have this rolling shed thing that would basically go out over the rocket, and then they'd roll it back, and it would take forever. I mean, it took like, I think it took 45 minutes or an hour to roll that, the huge, giant, you know, rocket co covering thing uh, back and forth. And, and here you just see this transport director just go, you know, in a couple minutes. Like, I missed it. I literally was not even looking at it for, uh, I don't, a minute or two. And I looked back, I'm like, oh my God, the rocket's horizontal. It's crazy. So um, let's see here. Let's answer a few more. Yeah. So this is a great, so Ryan BK says retrograde is harder. So kudos to Firefly if successful. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So it, we're seeing a lot of a lot of talk about the, the retrograde aspect also here from um, it uh, from Aditya Sony. If it's flying retrograde, doesn't that effectively mean it's at a negative velocity due to the Earth's rotation? That's exactly right. Yep. Um, this is a good question here from Leo Capella. Um, I don't know if uh, if we can pull this up. There is actually a Wikipedia article. Maybe maybe I'll work on it because again, what else are we doing right now? Um, orbital launches per year. There's a Wikipedia article that shows it. 
Um, timeline of space flight, I believe, is the, the Wikipedia article. Give me a second here, Andrew, and I'll, I'll get that pulled up, and then we can we can look at that. So uh, it's something like, here we go. Yeah, we are uh, clearly on track to be the most orbital launches in history. So um, I think actually was last year the most already. I forget. I thought I thought it was like tied. But it might be, it might have been the most last year already. Um, so, yeah, the question, what's the record for orbital launches in a year? Uh, let's see, it's, uh, successful 135 that year. I think that's the current record. And you can see the planned number is way beyond that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's coming up to the point where there's a good chance that SpaceX on their own next year might come close to breaking the record for number of orbital launches out of a single company. But now that we got so many companies launching too, it's just, this is like a, a curve that I don't think many people predicted seeing happen, just going crazy on the number of orbital launches. Pretty fun time to be a spaceflight fan because uh, there's never a dull moment. So, yeah. <laughs> I like this question here. Uh, this is from Blame Techie. Uh, who is at 26 months of membership. Thank you so much for your support. That really means a lot. But saying, uh, <laughs> if you do a 1-100 Firefly model, which, Firefly, we got to talk. I would love to make your rocket one of our next model rockets. That'd be so cool. Uh, then we're going to need a 1-100 Luna as well, our, our locational uplinking networking asset van. That'd be pretty fun to, uh, to do that. So th that'd be really fun. Um, let's see here. Uh, so the reason for this, uh, Apollo is saying, overall, the cameras, it's not the cameras, it's just this camera. I'm under an orange tent, and we actually have a, a separate, totally separate sheet muslin that's trying to block all the light so I don't look like an, a pumpkin. But I, I, I am a pumpkin today. I got pretty burnt yesterday, and I'm also surrounded by orange. I guess that's what happens when, uh, you know, branding over, uh, branding over white balance, I guess. <laughs> it's... Is exactly what happened. It's a me problem. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just want to read this one. This, one's, this is fun. This is from Dorian saying, Tim, I'm, I'm... Yeah, that's the orange tent. If you can't tell how orange it is, it's breaking our camera, basically, because it's so orange. The sensor's like, that's all there is. We've tried painting this camera up, and it's just... Yeah, I don't even know. I'll, I'll fix it for next time. That's how orange the tent is, though. And you can see the the sheet there trying to block the, the light. And it's still casting through it orange. And you can maybe not even see me. I don't know if you can. Whee! There is my hand. Yeah. But isn't that fun? Look at how the cameras are all in sync. Never mind. It doesn't matter. Okay. So uh, D Dorian wanted to say uh, it was just a, a fun thank you. Um, saying six months ago, I knew nothing about rockets in space. Then I saw a video about the Apollo computers from the Computer Museum. And then uh, Dorian said, that video made me acknowledge that I knew nothing about space. Since then, I've watched all my videos about engine types. I really appreciate that, Dorian. Actually, that's something that we sh that we probably could do here while we're while we're just hanging out together. Uh, you know, we might as well take some time. I, I want to go back to everydayastronaut.com. I'm going to click on our articles here. Um, and if we click on our articles, you can see it, we, we made a video about engine cycles. And yesterday we were talking a ton about um, about the uh, tap-off cycle that, that they use on the Reaver and the Lightning engine here. Uh, we did a really deep dive here called, you know, how do you power a rocket engine? And it goes over all the cycle types. So obviously this is primarily a YouTube video, but our awesome website crew was able to make this into an article too because I know that some people want to see stuff or, or even being able to search, you know, being able to find a certain thing. Like if you remember something in your head, like I, I'm trying to remember what that one thing is, just be able to hit, you know, control F and find it on the, on the page. It's always um, a useful asset as well. So as you can tell, there's a long, long article um, and I wanted to get down to here. We'll show our uh, what tap off looks like. Uh, it's fuel rich, closed cycle. Then we get into full flow. I probably could have just used the navigations because, but I'm I'm a silly boy and I just like to scroll. So here's what the tap off cycle kind of looks like. Um, so you know most so turbo pump rocket engines that are that are fed uh, high you know in order to get high pressure uh, into the combustion chamber you need to you need a pump. You need a, a pump to force that fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. And so uh, this rocket, like like other turbo pumps, so if you have a, a gas generator or a pre-burner uh, that hits a turbine, and then that turbine is connected to a shaft, that shaft is then connected to your fuel pump and your oxidizer pump. And those force the, the, the propellants into the combustion chamber. 
Now with the, the tap off cycle, it's really interesting. Instead of having a separate, so a, a pre burner and a gas generator is basically like a miniature rocket engine. It literally is its own form of rocket engine that you then point at the turbine to, to you use. Uh, you use that little rocket engine to generate pressure and heat, and then you send it through the turbine, and then that turbine gets spun up. It takes that that pressure and that heat and turns it into kinetic energy, and so uh, and that's you know that's how turbines work. Again, in a turbocharger in a car, that's how that works. But with a tap off, they literally uh, instead of having a separate thing, they actually just pretty much more or less put a, a hole in the side of the of the engine, and they had to force that they allow some of that hot gas and and high pressure gas out of the engine and they use that to power the turbine and to run the pumps. But the, the secret sauce is, you'll notice the main combustion chamber in our example is a complete example. Uh, we have the main combustion chamber at something like, you know, 1400 degrees Celsius-ish. Uh, or, or we made up some numbers. But what's crazy is the turbine can only handle something like, you know, 150 degrees Celsius. So there's there's some secret sauce there that is some of the magic of these Reaver engines. Um, there's, I, and I don't, I genuinely don't even know. I'm not giving you some like, I, I don't know what the intellectual property is and, and how they developed it, but somehow they were able to lower the temperature between the main combustion chamber and the turbine without even any additives, without having to make it more fuel rich by adding an extra fuel injector or anything. So, um, yeah, so that's um, that's pretty awesome. And it's, it's a really simple, elegant solution. It, and I love that, the, that Firefly has been using this because I've been waiting for a company to utilize the tap-off cycle. So, yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, this is, I just want to read this. Um, I, sure, we might, as, we could talk about whatever we want. Here's a question from, um, from Moonman uh, asking, Soviet N1 had large number of engines and used to develop vibrations, which resulted in four explosions and four launch tests. Will Starship have the same fate? Let me remind you, my friends, the N1 had 30 engines. Starship's currently at 33 engines. But don't forget, the Falcon Heavy uses 27 engines. So it's not like the number of engines is not always indicative of failure. Just because the one that's in our head that has a lot of engines failed a lot, the N1, on all four tests, it really had nothing to do with the number of engines per se, but it had to do with the testing, the lack of testing, the lack of maturity of the engine, the fact that they couldn't even static fire. They didn't have the support system or way to take the first stage and test out all 30 engines together. Um, and as a matter of fact, the NK-15 that actually flew on the N1 um, for the first couple missions had, or actually I think for all of them, they couldn't test fire each individual engine because they used pyrotechnics to open the valves. So instead of a hydraulic system or something to modulate the valves to run the engine, they literally used one-time use pyrotechnics. So once you use, once you fired the engine, you had to take it back apart basically to run it again. So the Soviets with the N1 rocket didn't get that opportunity. So they literally had to put engines on. And the first time they ever fired those engines were when 29 other engines were firing along with it and the rocket was leaving the pad. As you can imagine, that's not a great way to have to test something for the first time is while it's <laughs> accelerating off the ground. Uh, it just seems like not opportune uh, situations there. So the N1's failures really had more to do with that than it had to do with um, anything else. It really it wasn't to do with the number of engines. It really was simply due to those other con uh, restrictions. So, um, hey, this is cool. Um, th thank you, Taserface, for coming in here from the NASA Space Flight stream. I really appreciate that. And... Always fun to see our friends over at NASA Space Flight. I, I hope I get to run into Jack and some of the people from NSF tonight. Uh, since there was a scrub, maybe we'll have to be getting together and saying hi since they're in town uh, as, as members of the press with pad cameras here. Because, again, Firefly has been so awesome to work with. They are allowing media out there to the pad. So very, very cool. Uh, Harold Davis, thank you so much for your generous tip. I really, really appreciate that. It means a lot to me and the rest of us here. So, um <laughs> Um, okay, interesting. Uh, I will update Chrome. We have people telling me to update Chrome. I will do that. Thank you very much for letting me know about that. I'm not paying any attention, so this is good to know. Harold Davis, thank you so much for becoming a member. Much appreciated. Um, let's see. This, I, I do happen to know. Dustin wants to know, do I happen to know any of the history about this particular launch pad? Yes, again, it was. It used to be a Delta II launch pad, and I actually saw my first ever launch that I got to see see but mostly kind of hear but mostly kind of saw not much because it was so foggy was a delta 2 launch
I did see CRS3. I didn't actually get to catch the launch, but my camera did. I left my camera on the launch pad, and I had, literally had to go home. Uh, so CRS3 was supposed to be my first launch ever. So I kind of still consider it my first launch. It's at least the first time to the pad, at least the first time for me to see all that stuff. But then in 2014, I got to see OCO2 out here in Vandenberg. And uh, it was very, very foggy. We literally saw nothing, almost. But that was the first launch that I, that I saw. Uh, so yeah, it used to be a Delta II pad. I don't remember if it was something before that. It likely was. It likely you know, would have been a, a Thor missile or something like that um, before it would have been a Delta II pad. But there's tons of history out here at Vandenberg that's so, so cool. Um, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but right behind me, over my shoulder, if maybe we can pull up that ugly cam, that the orange gross cam. Man, why is that so underexposed? Uh, but in the shadow there, you can maybe see a little bit of a NASA logo. That's because this building here used to actually uh, was was going to be housing the space shuttle. And the space shuttle Enterprise, actually, the glider version, the one that never actually flew to space, uh, did end up in this hangar at one point. Um, Allegedly, I feel like the vertical stabilizer would not fit through that, though. So I don't know how they would have done that. To me, that seems way too small for the big vertical stabilizer on the space shuttle. But anyway, they cut out part of the mountain to bring the space shuttle from the the uh, the, the roadway. And then they even uh, they took it into here, and then they stacked it out at Slick 6, which is where the Delta IV and Delta IV Heavy, Delta IV Heavy flies out of Vandenberg. And it's just... a incredible launch site out there so cool it would have been so cool to see a space shuttle fly in the mountains of california these beautiful hills uh those images again of the, the space shuttle i actually have that still pulled up in my in my browser here um yeah check that out uh it's it's still one of my favorite images just seeing a space shuttle with the united space united states air force on the side of the building uh and when andrew can for a second I'll pull that up i just like that image so much that i'm that i'm making you pull it up <laughs> I just love that image. I'm sorry. I just think that's super cool. Yeah. Um, can you imagine what that would have looked like to see a space shuttle taking off just in mountains and hills? Ugh. So sad. So that that got canceled uh, because of the Challenger disaster. They had to rethink a lot of the program, redo a lot of stuff, and redesign a lot of things. And unfortunately, the space shuttle never got the chance to fly on a polar orbit. No human has still ever flown on a polar orbit. But that could have been the second opportunity for the United States to launch from this exact launch pad to a polar orbit, and it got canceled. So, yeah, uh, this is from uh, from Jeff. Thank you so much for gas money for the van. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, this is from David Taylor. This is a really good question. It's about this retrograde orbit we've been talking about. Why does Earth rotation uh, Earth rotation direct affect the orbit of something in space? So to get into space you have to gain a lot of horizontal velocity. You have to be going about 17,500 miles an hour, uh, which is about 27,000 kilometers an hour, 28,000 kilometers an hour. So as the, the Earth also spins, it's something like 1,600-ish kilometers an hour, 1,000 miles an hour, something around there. So the Earth is spinning. Now imagine if you uh, you know, had, the, say, a, a basketball spinning and you uh, you know had a BB on there and you let go of that BB, obviously it's going to have some of that inertial, uh, uh, you know, the, the rotation uh, some of the energy, kinetic energy, already going with that rotation. So it has some of the centripetal force rotation. I don't remember. Yeah. It, I, uh, centrifugal. It's not one of the two options. I don't remember. Uh, angular momentum. How about that? It's got angular momentum for sure. Um, is that right? I don't remember. I'm tired. Uh, that's just my excuse for everything these days. I don't know. I'm tired. So anyway, uh, the Earth is the same way. The Earth is spinning. It spins, you know, once every 24 hours, but it's spinning very fast. So if you go straight up and straight back down, you will be this, in the same spot relative to the Earth uh, for the most part. But believe it or not, when you're trying to get into orbit, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to speed up. You're trying to go really fast so that you go up first to get out of the atmosphere. The atmosphere slows a rocket down that's trying to get you know anything down. It slows cars down. It slows everything down. It's it's thick. It's soupy, and uh, you know it compresses and becomes uh, wind resistance and air resistance. So rockets go up to get out of the atmosphere, but pretty quickly they start actually you know flying over and doing what's called a gravity turn to start getting more and more horizontal velocity because it's the horizontal velocity of a rocket that that makes it stay in space. If you go up. And you come back down like New Shepard, all you do is you, you come right back down. Gravity's going to pull you right back down. But if you go fast enough, your parabola actually ends up getting to the point where it misses the Earth entirely. So you have to go really, really, really fast. So obviously, if you take the Earth's rotation into account, you gain about 1,600 kilometers an hour. If you have to go against it, not only do you have to, you not only do you not gain that, 
but you also have to work against it, so it is much harder. Uh, you lose about half of your payload capability if you are flying retrograde, believe it or not. So, yeah. Um, let's see, this is from uh, MHZ UHF. Buy something stronger than a coffee to cope with the scrub. Have fun driving across the country. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much from Cami Moop. The past few streams have been really cool despite all the scrubs. Uh, how busy do you see this Luna being for the foreseeable future? So let me let me remind you again, I don't intend personally to always just be doing broadcasts like this. This these are special missions for me. These are these are really extra special missions. I don't want to be driving coast to coast every week trying to figure out how am I going to do this stream because I don't always love doing it. I just love doing it when it's something new and exciting. So this mission has been just incredible because we have the opportunity to set up cameras like this. And I mean, come on. I don't we don't get this opportunity. It's so cool that Firefly has been allowing us to, you know, to set up cameras like this and have their cameras on the pads and it's just, it's incredible. So obviously I'm not going to say no to that. And I just love the people at Firefly. Ever since uh, I started talking to them and I, I got a tour there before I did the public tour with Tom Marcusic, I toured there early in 2021, I think. And I just fell in love with the company. I just thought it was so cool. And all the people I met with were awesome. And I, I got excited about what they're working on. So it's been really fun for me uh, to, to be able to do this. This is a big honor for me. I mean, obviously I, I'm I'm hosting an official rocket launch. Just absurd. So I don't want to be doing Luna all over the country, back and forth and, and all that stuff. It is just happens that literally there's so many things happening at once at this current moment in time. I mean, we have Firefly out here at Vandenberg. We have Artemis and SLS, the, the biggest rocket and most powerful well, most powerful rocket that NASA's ever flown, you know, on the launch pad in Florida. I, that's something I don't want to miss. That's something I want to do the best job I can, especially when we learned that NASA was going to be providing 4K camera feeds. It takes a lot to be able to ingest 4K, and we have that on on uh, we have that on basically up to eight channels now for for NASA, and that's huge. That's that's just been I mean that's so cool. So Luna is really a means to an end, and for frankly, we just had a lot of gear sitting there in Texas that wasn't being used. A lot of really nice gear. I mean, you, you saw the van tour, I'm sure. Hopefully, uh, you know we have a lot of stuff. At, you know. That's just been sitting there in Texas, and I don't want to go live for absolutely everything out at Starbase. I want to go live when Starbase is doing something really cool. Uh, so when Starship gets ready to do, you know, 33-inch and static fire when they get ready for orbit, that's you know that's what that's what we invested that gear in for was was that. But now we can use utilize it when there's other exciting things like like this rocket here on the pad today. Uh, those are opportunities that I just didn't want to miss. So that's what Luna's for. I, I, again, I hope I'm not constantly battling timelines and driving across the country stressing out because it's, that part's not that fun, but this part is, is super fun. And someday, I, I really think someday we'll actually catch a rocket launch with this van I, uh, and or with the new tracking mount. The new tracking mount has not seen a lo rocket launch either. That's insane to me. We have these really nice tracking mounts, robotic heads that are, you can see the one pointing up. That is a big, Ryan, can you go stand next to it real quick so people get a sense of scale? Um, and I don't know if we can paint that camera up at all. I'm sure it's just where you don't have control. It, it is plugged back in actually, by the way. Um, yeah, you can see how, how big all of it with the, the big 800 millimeter F5.6 lenses and and Ryan next to it. I mean, it, it's it's a large, beefy beast with a with Blackmagic 12K camera on it. We actually are shooting it in 8K at 120 frames a second. I mean, she's beefy. That's a big and that mount itself weighs like 15 or 20 kilograms. It's it's heavy. It's it's big. That'd be 40 45 pounds ish. I don't know. Maybe I'm making up a number, but it's around. It's it's big. They're big and heavy, uh, and and really awesome. So. Yeah, we hopefully someday we can actually utilize those. We have three of those, and so far we haven't had a chance to use it once because the missions that we've taken it to have scrubbed. So, yeah, again, it's a shame that today's rocket didn't get to go off, but I am glad to know there are new dates on the on the timeline, so that's awesome. Harold Davis, um, let's see. This is uh, Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, I meant to ask if you had any resources for businesses to learn what's needed to develop a launch site. Whoa. To develop a launch site, I don't know. I think you really have to work really closely with the government, honestly, is what. Uh, there's very few options in the United States. I'm pretty sure at this point, I'm guessing they're almost all entirely full. I don't I don't know if there's too many more options for a launch site, honestly. Um, 
That's that's I, I have no advice on that. I have zero experience really with anything professionally in the actual aerospace industry, but especially when it comes to a launch site, I, I really have no concept of that unfortunately. So um yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, yeah, this uh, uh believe it or not, Mike, this is not the reason for today's scrub. Any more wind and the canopy will rud. <laughs> I mean it Believe it or not, that's not the reason for the scrub, but it, it, it could, I mean, right as you say that, I feel like the wind just picked up like crazy and it's, <laughs> and we are getting a show of, of force on it. Yeah, that canopy is gonna, hopefully it just continues to stay strong. So um, let's see, this is this is a good question from from um, Mikhail, or Michael, Mikhail, Mikhail, sorry for mispronouncing. What, what job would I do after YouTube? Hmm. I haven't told many people this outside of my, my close friends and family, uh, but after YouTube, so I, I want to be I want to be doing this for the you know when humans go back to the moon, I really want to be providing a live stream for that you know I, I want to be part of that I want to be part of that history, help sharing it as best I possibly can. That's that's kind of that's how far I want to get before I get burnt out on this whole thing, which you know the last couple of years have, have been pushing that a little bit for me with some of the stress. But, I mean, I still love it, so I'm, I'm going to keep going, and that's my goal is to be able to be, uh, you know, here covering this stuff when humans are walking on the moon again for the Artemis program. That's my goal. Um, and then, you know, when humans, maybe I'll have to come out of retirement uh, when humans land on, the, on Mars. But um, for me, though, honestly, what I want to do next is uh, – what was that, Andrew? He, <laughs> he's got it. I, I, I probably want to become an architect or, or, or work on houses and, and – and build houses. I just, I actually really love, uh, I love interior design and, and, and layouts of houses and I love architecture and that's honestly probably something I'll get into. Maybe I'll try to blend the two and do like, you know, interior design for Mars habitats or something like that. But, um, you know, not the interior design, but just the overall layout and the, the, I just love it. I love it. It's, it's a big passion of mine. That's actually one of the things that I watch, uh, in my free time is architecture videos. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's probably what I'd like to do um, after after YouTube, but maybe I'll make it a YouTube channel anyway or something, who knows. Yeah, something that doesn't have crazy schedule conflicts all the time. But yeah, I think guys, honestly, that's probably gonna do it for us, honestly. Um, I think we're gonna get out of here and, and start working on, on, on Teardown and yeah, I think we'll get the, the teams fed and, and rested for once and, and work on getting out of here. So, yeah, unfortunately, you know, we didn't see a launch today, but the good news is we have a, a healthy rocket on the launch pad and we have new dates on the calendar. Those are two things that, that you know, you definitely hope for. So, um, and you even can see teams down there at the pad. So, yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, we didn't see a launch today, but I'm, I'm so thankful that you guys tuned in here. And again, I'm so, so thankful to the teams at Firefly for entrusting us to do this. I'm thankful for all of you watching. I'm thankful for all the support and the, the super chats and the, the memberships and the Patreon support. Really means the world to, to me here and, and all of us uh, trying to make this happen for you guys. So thank you so much for that opportunity. But um, I think I'm just going to sign out here. Uh, anything else, Ryan, that you can think of? Andrew, anybody? Yep. All right. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.